Welcome to the Bulletproof Cashflow Podcast, the go-to place to gain financial freedom through real estate investing. Here we interview investors, mentors, and entrepreneurs who share their secrets and advice to help you build passive income. Let's get into the show. Hey everyone, this is Augustino. Our next guest immigrated to the United States from Germany in 1997 with just two suitcases and thousands of dollars of student debt. Now, since 2002, he and his wife, Michelle, have purchased and sold over 4,000 properties. Now, with all this experience, he's become one of the country's foremost experts in land investment. And using these strategies, he set out to transform the lives of others by sharing his real estate acquisition and land investment techniques, and that's made his millions of dollars. Then on top of all that, he's also written this really great book, Forever Cash, which you'll need to pick up from Amazon. I'll include it as a link in the show notes. So with all that, I'd like to welcome Jack Bosch to the show. Hey, Jack, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much for having me, Agostino. I'm excited to be here. Yes, yes. So if you like what Jack has to say, you can reach him via his website at jackbosch.com. He also has many educational products there as well. Uh, you can also check out his YouTube channel at Land for Pennies or just go to the website, landforpennies.com. A lot of good info on there too. So, okay, Jack, maybe go ahead and tell the listeners about how you got your start in real estate. All right. Sounds good. So uh, as you mentioned, I'm an immigrant to the United States. I came over from Germany. Uh, my wife actually is an immigrant too. She came from Honduras, Central America. We met here in the U.S., fell in love, got started here with jobs and all those kind of things and, and ended up being separated literally 90% of the time because I was the only job I was able to get that was willing to sponsor that kind of the work visa. So I was always legal in the country, right? You want to add that to everything you say right now, right? And I was this company with us uh, that was fast growing, but it was a traveling job. So I was literally for a Monday morning, I would leave and I would come back Friday night, that tired, having worked 60, 70 hours. And we just plainly did not enjoy that at all. Neither one of us had real estate experience. Neither one of us had ever repaired anything my wife makes a joke, and actually, it's not a joke that when we have to hang, when we hang up pictures in the house, we bring somebody in to do it for us because I'm just so clumsy in this kind of things. But uh, point being is, we looked around. We 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 didn't pick real estate consciously at the beginning, or we didn't go and say like real estate is it immediately. We looked around. We we realized we were in a situation of a life situation that we did not enjoy at all. We hated being separate. We hated traveling. I hated working in an industry that I really felt like I was almost like a fraud. I didn't know what I was doing was technology. I'm not a technology guy. I had to learn all stuff. And I always felt I was bluffing my way through it there. And then, and it just wasn't right. But I needed to stick with it in order to get the green card. But so at the same time, though, we looked around. And after looking at all kinds of stuff, one day we came across real estate. And we figured out that this would be our ticket. We said, there's something to this. And it took us still another few years afterwards through dabbling and trying to figure stuff out until we finally came across the technique that has then uh, made us skyrocket and has changed our lives. And, and that technique is, as you mentioned already, is actually not house flipping, but it's land and lot flipping because you can do everything with land and lot that you can do a lot that we can do with houses just without the houses. So it's really, it's like, it's real estate made simple because you can do retailing, wholesaling, splitting, developing, anything other than rehabbing, uh, which who wants to do that anyway? And at the same time, you make the same profits everyone makes without most of the competition. And when we realized that, we put the pedal to the metal and we never looked back. And now we have done over 4,000 deals. Excellent. So how did you come across that first deal? Like, How did you find it, stumble upon it and just realize, aha, this is what I need to be doing? Right. So as I said, we dabbled in real estate. So the first thing we did, we read something up about driving for dollars, right? So we drove around neighborhoods and we found some boarded up houses, sent them letters. And that's where there's our first contact with direct mail. So we sent out some letters and one guy accepted it and we tried to sell the property. Nobody wanted to buy it. We freaked out. We backed out of that deal and I'm glad we did. But then we kept looking for other ways. And then we came across tax lien investing. Now, tax lien investing, living in Arizona, now uh, that I've lived in, now we have lived here for 19 years already. And by the way, now we're a citizen and everything, so we're here to stay. And living in Arizona, there's a tax lien state. So we went and bought some, with the very little money we had, we bought some tax liens because when we started learning about them. And what blew my mind is the fact that there's people out there 
who truly just don't want their properties anymore so much that they're stopping path taxes and let them go to an auction. And that just like was mind blowing coming from Europe where this is not known like that. It all works completely different. And no, first of all, I didn't even know how it worked in Europe, but aftermath, I kind of researched it works all completely different over there. So it blew my mind, but still we bought some tax liens and three weeks later they were redeemed. They were paid off and we made like $2 and 75 cents in, in interest. And we're like, okay, that's not so exciting. But the fact that somebody gave up on their property is, was still the exciting part. So we asked ourselves how we could make it better. And what we came up with, and one day it literally just popped up is, well, we sent some letters to these house owners when we were driving for dollars. Why can't we send some letters to the people who owe property taxes and see if they want to sell their properties to us directly? And we did. And now, by the way, we don't even care if they have back taxes anymore. We just pick landowners because we figured out how to crystallize and how to identify the people who don't want their properties anymore of all these thousands and millions of, of property records out there. So, but initially that's how we went after somebody owed property taxes and he owed a few hundred property dollars in property taxes. And he gave us a lot in Northern Arizona and a smaller community for $400 total, all in 400 bucks. Wow. And now here's the thing on this first deal where we did driving for dollars, where we drove around, looked for boarded up houses and then sent them a letter. We got a triplex on a contract after nobody wanted to buy it. We were tempted to buy that thing ourselves and rehab it. And luckily we didn't do it because we knew nothing about whether it costs a thousand or ten thousand dollars to rehab a kitchen. Does it cost two thousand or twenty thousand dollars to replace a roof? No idea because coming from another country, we didn't have any real estate experience. We also didn't know the terminology. We didn't know the, the rules. We didn't know anything. But getting a piece of land on a contract for $400 that after just doing some comparable analysis, like basically running comps, we saw that neighbor, similar properties down the street had sold for eight and $10,000. We're like, okay, 500 bu 400 bucks, that's 5% of market value. Like, what can go wrong? I mean, the answer is really nothing, right? I mean, worst case scenario, you sell it for a thousand, right? So what I did is we bought it, we paid the 500, we went down to the to the property, up to the property, put a sign on there, and literally the neighbor car walked across and bought it on the spot for $4,000 from us. Wow. And that was our first deal. Now that didn't deal make us rich, but that deal showed us that you don't really have to know much about real estate because I still didn't even know what the difference between a two by four and a two by eight is, right? I mean, I didn't know that these are like wooden sticks that you use to build houses. No idea. I didn't know what drywall was. Somebody talked to me about drywall. I was like, what are you talking about? My wall is dry, right? So no idea about real estate yet. I've done my first deal because when it's a piece of land, what do you have to look at? I mean, there might be a couple of trees on there. Great. You don't even have to visit them for the last 10 years. I haven't visited any of the properties that we bought or sold. Because yes. there's Google Maps, there's Google Earth, right? There's Google Street View. You can get pictures for marketing. You can look at them and there's nothing to see, nothing to estimate, no repairs, no mold, no, no roof repairs, no foundation repairs, no plumbing issues. I mean, there's none of the hassles that come with houses and nothing against houses. Now I have a portfolio of houses. I have apartment complexes like you do too. I have, uh, I have things like that. But I'm using these houses now to store the wealth that I've created. But the wealth was created and continues to be created by flipping these lots that you don't have to know much about in the first place. Yes. Now, how did you scale that business from where you are today? Because it's good to do, you know, you could do a, probably a handful of them. But I imagine at one point you must have had a machine going, right, to take down. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, we built this up to up to 80 deals a month. So yes, so we had one year in particular uh, where we did 80 deals a month. And so basically almost a thousand deals that year. And that was obviously a little bit crazy there. We had a team of 25 people working for us and all kinds of things. But nowadays we have uh, scaled down our team. We have only three people in our team that work on the land business and we still do a hundred deals a year. So it's like, and we have students of ours now, one of our particularly, it's his wife and himself and one virtual assistant, they do 150 deals a year. Wow. Right. The reason we have three people is because they do all the work and I don't really do the work anymore on it. I just supervise it, make the offers and make sure that the work is being done while my wife and I are traveling and my daughter, our daughter are traveling around the world. We take three months of the year travel around the world. But to answer your question, 
uh, how do we scale it? Well, because it's so simple, because there is no much complexity to it from a point of view of like, you don't have to talk to an inspector, you don't have to talk to an appraiser, you don't have to talk to a bank, you don't have to talk to contractors and all this kind of stuff. You can do more deals in the same time as the house flippers do. And by the way, our average deal has the same margin as the house flip has. Anywhere from five to fifty thousand dollars is our margins, right? It's five on a small deal, ten, twenty on a normal deal, and fifty on a good one, and sometimes even more than that. But I've bought lots for eighteen hundred dollars, sold for eighty-six thousand dollars. But so because there's less to it, less moving pieces involved. It's uh, you can do more deals in the same time. So in the first year, part time while having jobs, we did 63 deals. Now you do that by outsourcing a few pieces. Like you outsource the phone calls to a call center. You outsource the title work, obviously, to a title company. And then all we needed to focus on was sending out letters, making offers, and then marketing the properties. And we market these properties all online using Craigslist, Zillow, uh, Landwatch, using uh, Facebook Marketplace, all these kind of different online free resources that you can use and that you can do from anywhere. So even though I had a job that I was working late and I was working, I was traveling, it still allowed me to do this business because you don't have to go inspect anything and you can do everything really virtually. As a matter of fact, we have now students from Germany that do this in the US, from China that do this in the US, from Canada, from South America, from all over the world that do this in the US very successfully. Now, is that what your training program, I know you have a training program, is that, is that basically how they learn how to do it is through your programs? Yeah, so we, we do, now we do land, we do uh, houses, but only for our own purpose. We buy houses as rental houses. We have a portfolio of almost 50 rental houses. We buy apartment complexes for the cash flow and to store our, our assets and store our the, the wealth that we, the cash flow and the cash that we've created. But uh, we teach only one thing, because that one thing is responsible for everything. And that one thing is land flipping. So yes, we have a course on that and we have seminars and, and coaching programs and things like that for that. Right, right, right. Good, good. So pivoting on, on the multifamily side, just before the call, we were talking a little bit about some of the places that you're currently buying. Do you have any, any favorite places that you're currently buying today as far as uh, multifamily is concerned? Mm, yes and no. We're buying mainly in the secondary markets and even tertiary markets because the primary markets are just, in my opinion, tapped out. And the prices are so high that it just doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. Again, this is one of the fastest growing cities always in the United States. And I know of a guy that bought in a C and D class neighborhood. He bought something for $60,000 a unit two years ago, and he's selling it for $119,000 now. And it just, the math doesn't make sense to me, whichever way you do it. So we're not buying there. We have a deal under contract right now that we're uh, about to raise the money for. It's in Oklahoma City. We have a deal that we bought two, three months ago, a few months ago in uh, North Carolina, which was did just fine and during the hurricane, uh, during the recent hurricanes and so on. And we have a property in Louisiana to an, a multifamily. And then we have um, single families in, in three markets. I like Cleveland. I like where you are, kind of your neck of the woods. I do like Phoenix. It's just, and I do like Dallas and I do like LA and all the markets where people like to buy. It's just that numbers don't make sense right now. Yeah. I'm seeing the same thing right now too. It requires a whole lot more work to try to find the deal and locate them. It's uh, it's a challenge. It really is. I mean, the way that I'm doing is just through networking and connecting with brokers and, and holding live events and getting in front of people. I mean, I'm not sure. How, how, how do you do that? How do you actually find the deals that you, you're coming across and locking down? Well, again, on the land side, we do it to direct mail because on the land side, it's very, very simple. You just get a list from the county or from a data service nowadays. You filter it down by the criteria that we've set. And then you might have 10,000 records left and you send out, I don't know, 500 a week, 100 a week. One of my guys started, many of our students start with 100, 200 a week, and you get 5 to 10% response rates on that. Really? That much? <laughs> yeah, because there's no competition in the land. Yeah. I mean, how many people do you know that flip land? Not that many, right? Everyone goes after houses. Everyone goes after apartments right now. Nothing wrong with that, but there is just more competition. So that's why we self-source our deals to direct mail in the land side. On the apartment complex side, we have hired a acquisition manager who just became the best friend with a whole bunch of brokers. 
And now through that, we get from the brokers, we get like early dips. And then after we bought a couple of apartment complexes, it was became clear to them that we're players, that we can close, that we have the capability, that we're not tire kickers. And now we're getting first serve on quite a few deals. We get the first opportunity to, to come in. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think it's just what you said, though, too. It's uh, building that credibility is severely important, so important. But uh, using that that uh, cash flowing property to store value from the efforts put forth on land flipping. It, and, uh, yeah. you know, it really seems like land flipping is probably the best way to, to quickly do it, given that the prices are just so stupid right now. They're they're ridiculous. Exactly. So, we have a lot of our customers and a lot of people, our students, as we call them, they come to us uh, in, in one of really kind of three scenarios. One, either they're a complete beginner, just like I was, and they have no idea what they even want to do. And they're most comfortable, just like I was, with something that is very simple, where they don't have to learn all the complexity of real estate before they can do their first deal. The second group of people that comes to us is people that have been burned by, let's say, I want to say like, by the bad gurus. We all know there's not, there's a few bad gurus out there that make a big hype and then they don't provide much value. And they come to us because uh, kind of like as their last straw, there's like, okay, I'm going to give this one more chance. And then boom, we have a huge success rate, right? And then they have uh, success. And the third kind of is the funniest. This is actually frustrated house flippers who can't get deals right now because there's so much competition that they're tough. They have known about us for a while, but now they're like, Okay, let me look at this Jack Bosch kind of guy. Let me see if it's really true what he says. And they're starting it, and boom, one of our my friends, basically, that has been listening to me for years, finally, House Flipper, finally came over, and he did a few deals. One of them was made him $240,000, so pretty good return there. And the key to us was that, I mean, it does, everything works, right? Like, as a matter of fact, one of the things we do, we create cash flow from land. Perhaps we can talk about that for a second, too. Yeah, absolutely. So we create cash flow from land. And so you can create cash, but it's the simplest way to build something up, to start up with, to build some equity, to build some money. One of our students, literally, Louis and Irina, they just literally yesterday reported that in a year and a half, they paid off their car and paid off their house, just doing that method. And that's beautiful because... It shows that you can build cash, you can build cash flow, you can you can change your life, and then you can learn real estate in the process, and then you move on to more complex things, and that's my path, right? If somebody would have, now we have apartment complexes, but if somebody back 15 years ago would have come to me with an apartment complex, I would have run the other way, not because it's, a, it's not a good investment, it's an awesome investment, because I didn't understand it. Yeah. But uh, now, after having done some deals and learned the terminology and learned the complexity and then mo- bought some houses and bought some things, now I understand and now I'm comfortable with it. And But everyone here, everyone has a different comfort level. So you got to start where your comfort level is. Yeah, that's right. So now uh, getting started in, in the world of land flipping, for instance, up here, it'd probably be a challenge to try to find something in and around Cleveland. But it seems to me like you can pretty much do it anywhere. I think you alluded to that earlier. You have friends and, and people in, in Germany that are buying here in the States. Yeah. Are there any specific target markets? Like, let's say, for instance, I want to get started in, in, in the world of uh, land. What would I do? How would I do it? Besides, of course, picking up your program. Absolutely. Yes, there is. Uh, the, the, we go after three particular properties. So there's not necessarily a geographical target market. Although I want to say when I specify these three markets right now, I'm going to make a caveat on that. So where we focus on three kinds of properties, number one, our bread and butter is the outskirts of big cities. So right where the big cities end and but where you're not in the middle of nowhere, just right where they end, you end up what's called the path of growth. Right. So when you're in the path of growth, that's a beautiful place to be because two kinds of buyers are focused on are very interested in these properties. One is future retirees that don't have the money to live in the city because it's more expensive. They want to buy an acre for $20,000, $25,000, which you picked up for $2,500, right? So they want to buy that, potentially buy it with seller financing, which is, by the way, how we create cash flow from land. We sell tons and tons of land with seller financing. We buy something for $2,500, sell it for $25,000, get a $3,000 down payment, and get $400 a month in monthly cash flow. 
That's great. We got our money back when we sold the property. So we are zero out of pocket in the deal. And now we get $400 a month for the next eight years without anything to repair. So it's truly pure cash flow. Right? So these kind of people interested in those kind of properties, sometimes they need cash sell of financing, but also financial investors are interested in it because if the city is growing and they're three miles outside, five miles outside, it's only a matter of time until the city approaches and then the value of these properties skyrockets. So these are guys that are coming in with cash. They're paying you the twenty-five dollars or $30,000 for their property. You made 10 times your money and they're sitting on it for the next 10 years and then might sell that property for $150,000 again to somebody else. So it makes sense for them and it makes sense for us. Yes. And it almost seems like this could also be a hedge against uh, an economic downturn as well, right? I mean, as long as uh, you're, you're buying it right and you're producing that cash flow, you're, you're in a good spot, it would seem, right? Right. When the market crashed, we had a few people stop making payments to us, but only about 20%. The 80% kept paying. And what happens if they stop paying? Well, you foreclose on them, you get the property back, and you get to resell it again, right? Now, if you resell it, you might resell it at a lower price. But remember, you bought it for $2,500, sold it for $25,000 with a $3,000 down payment. You got all your money back already. If they do payments for three years at $400 a month, that's almost $15,000 that they paid you. And now they default. Anything you sell that property for is gravy. Yes. Right? So every every dollar that you sell it for. So if you now you sell it not for 25, but for 15 again, because market prices have gone down. Okay, you make another $15,000 on top of the 15 you already made. And uh, it's a beautiful scenario, although, of course, we don't hope anyone stops making payments. It's not our business model. We want people to finish their payments. If somebody's struggling with that, we do loan modifications. We change their loan. We stretch out their loan. We, we, make, we accommodate them because we do want them to fulfill their American dream of owning that piece of property. Yes. We always want to play this in a way that, that at the end of the day, they're happy with making that decision to buy uh, that land from us. But yes, it's a, it can be a hedge strategy, and exactly that's what it did. When the market crashed, uh, it carried us nicely through. While we make some adjustments to the new market conditions, we had seventy thousand dollars a month coming in just cash flow from land payments. Wow, awesome! And that is pretty good. That's a pretty good number to to keep you carrying through, right? Like we we just sat in the pool and figured out what to do and how to adjust this, and and then once we figured out that we went from these. Uh, from the one way of selling that we did in, in the boom to the online selling that we have done ever since. Uh, there was a few months in between and it carried us right nicely through that. It creates that that bad, or like that stability of cash flow, which also is important. If somebody, we have now people who does that, do that, they have, let's say, five or $10,000 a month coming in in cash flow. And all of a sudden they have a family emergency. One guy's mom, one of our Hall of Fame students, his mom has developed cancer. Guess what? He can stop everything he's doing and just take care of his mom because every single month, $10,000 is coming into his bank account. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing about cash flow. Yes. Oh, anyway, but the second, uh, just quickly, the second kind of properties we focus on is larger acres, more in the rural areas. And that's where a caveat is. If you're in the Midwest, almost all larger acreage in the rural areas is farmland. So that's the only reason, that's the only kind of land that you don't want to do in that Midwestern area. But as you said, you can live anywhere you want. We have guys living in New Hampshire doing deals in Florida, people living in Florida doing deals in California, people in California doing deals in Colorado, and people in Colorado doing deals in Arizona. It doesn't matter where you live, you can do this anywhere. So so just don't do more large acre deals in the Midwest because you're going to write letters to farmers and they're not going to give their properties away for 10 cents on the dollar right? because they end up producing properties. But they will in Arizona, they will in Nevada, they will in Colorado, they will in Florida, they will in Tennessee, they will in, in North and South Carolina, they will in Alabama, they will, et cetera, in Texas and so on and so on. All over the place, they will because it's not used as farmland. And the third kind of property we focus on is very simply in the city, in fill lots. The numbers are different, the response rates are different, but hey, you can buy an infill lot, an $80,000 $80, infill lot for $40,000 and go flip it for 60 again. You make $20,000 on that too, that works just as well. Now, in the first two ones, we don't offer more, ever more than five to 25 cents on a dollar. In the third one, you can go above that. But that's the beauty of it. If you never pay more than 20, 25 cents on a dollar, you're really protected from all kinds of downsides. 
But now in that third scenario, conceivably, the city could be the owner of that property. Do you ever deal with with, that, with those scenarios where the city actually owns that plot of land? And because usually they want you to build something on it, right? Right. I haven't dealt with that much. I know that in Tennessee, particularly Memphis, there's some properties that you can get almost for free if you commit to build something on it. And that's the one thing that I've never done. I've never built anything. We're not builders. We're flippers. And then we take the money and we buy and hold properties from it. And that's actually when the book that you mentioned, Forever Cash, there's another link, if I may share it. There's a link called forevercashbook.net because the book is officially out of print. But under forevercashbook.net, you can still get a few copies and uh, that we kind of you can make available for just a few bucks. And uh, because on Amazon, it's kind of sometimes they want like outrageous amounts for the book. Therefore, uh, you can get it on, on forevercashbook.net. But the book is really that financial philosophy of make active money, create cash flow, roll it over into something that lasts forever. And I think there's there's some opportunities in the city that I'm finding anyway. Uh, I'm not really into the land thing just yet, but it seems like I ought to be looking at it at this point. But where the city owns the land, especially here in Cleveland, there is an opportunity because just like I said, it's in the path of progress, but then they want you to commit to building something on it. And, just, and I'm not a builder. I have no intention of building anytime soon. But it could still be an opportunity. Maybe, maybe it's a joint venture with a, with another builder that would come in and then somehow broker that deal where you get a piece of it, flip the land over, and away you go. But uh, again, I've never done anything like that. But absolutely, that would be. But again, development is something I haven't I haven't touched. I found that I can churn my deals if I can take that same money and churn it five times a year or with five deals. I'll make probably more than I would make on a development deal. Even if it's just five thousand dollars, you turn five into twenty, make a fifteen thousand dollar program. Take those four or five, five, those twenty, buy five, four deals of five each, turn that into twenty each. You made it into eighty, right? And you do that one more time, perhaps create another hundred. You've created one hundred eighty-five, hundred, almost two hundred thousand dollars, starting with the five thousand dollars. And we have done that in less than a year, just starting with that, and then multiplied it much, much more many more times. And as a matter of fact, it took us only 10 months to get uh, completely out of debt and build one year of living expenses on the sidelines. And I'm saying that not to brag, I'm saying that just to show that that without knowing much about real estate, it is possible to build something. Without having much money, it is possible to build something. Well, you know what though? I think it requires a commitment and it requires the right mindset. Aside from the technical skills, I mean, you present the technical skills, you you present them in your materials, but if that person's not committed to doing it, then they'll never become debt-free and they won't build up that, that store of wealth. That's that's the long and short of it. It does still require wealth. There's no such thing like it's not a wake-up wealthy program. No, it does require work. It does require dedication. It does require more than anything consistency. And that's probably the number one thing that we applied to it. Even though we had jobs, we went... Almost every night we went on at it for another hour or two hours or so after work. And we're on the phone with each other, my wife, and we're just like, hey, how do you do this? How do you do that? And helping each other, doing our different tasks that we had split between the two of us. And, and then on the weekend, we would come home and we get deals accepted. And back then we thought we had to go look at them. We, I would literally land Friday afternoon by airplane. My wife would pick me up. We would go get a rental car and we would go drive up to, to Northern Arizona to go look at these properties. Now we haven't looked at them for years anymore, but, but back then we thought, and, and then we come back Sunday and Monday we'll travel again. And that's, you don't have to do 64 deals in your first year. You don't have to do 800 deals in, the, in, in your third year, right? We have plenty of students right now that do five deals in the first half a year and generate $75,000 and they're tickled pink because that's twice what they make in their job, right? Yeah. And now they can quit their job and, and with basically what's a hobby, they can make two, three, four times what they made before. And it's, absolutely mind-blowing to them and and that's what's happening right now because there's not much competition uh there's lots of deals to be had yes now shifting gears i wanted to get your opinion on on uh something that you might have you touched on a second ago but i want to get your thoughts on it and and that is uh the economic cycle right now many people are saying it's fine the economy is fine other people are saying there's a blip coming and other people are saying we're, we're in for an all-out disaster where do you see 
the economy happening, say in the next, you know, 12 to 24 months. And uh, I think you, you already discussed how the, how land is, is a potential way of protecting your yourself as far as cash flow is concerned. But I wanted to get more of your thoughts around what are your thoughts in, in terms of the economy and where it's going? I would think I'm more in favor of the second option. So I think definitely there's going to be a slowdown, slowdown in both of the economy as well as a slowdown in the real estate. But I don't expect a full-blown crash because the fundamental underwriting policies of the banks have are not the same as they were back in 2004, 5, 6. There's no such thing like 5% down, no proven income loans or anything like that. The no, uh, how do you call them? Liar loans or back, back to this, like no. Like interest only type of thing or no income. Uh, yeah, there's no such thing like 110% loans. There's no such thing where you don't have to show any income, things like that. Now, actually, there are back these no income verification loans. That's what I mean. No income verification loans are back, but they're back with 30 and 40% down payments. And so the banks are protecting themselves much, much more than they have before. And as a result, I do what I think is, is that the growth, the, the, the market, like the value increase of residential real estate will slow down, will come to a halt. Some areas might even have a little dip in values, but I don't think that we're going to be in for a big crash. Because in the number one reason I said, I belong to a real estate investor association. I think everyone should belong to a real estate investor association. We talked about a little bit about you, Joe. You were at one where I actually mentioned my name that I'm coming up to, to an event, to another event that you're going to speak. In the one that I belong to, they, they always put up a chart. And the chart they put up, a dot in 2001. And then they put in the chart how the prices went skyrocketing and they crashed again. And now they came roaring back. And then against that, they put out on the chart just... Where would prices be if prices would just have gone up by two and a half to three percent every single year? Right? If there would have been no run up and no crash and no recovery, if it just would have been a very boring uptick of three percent, two and a half to three percent per year, where would prices have to be? And if you do that in our, at least in our market of Arizona, which is one of the one of the wildest swinging markets out there, then what it shows is that we are just right about there where we should be with an overall 25 to 3% appreciation since the year 2001. So prices have almost like recovered back to a seasonally or uh, over a 17-year adjusted 2.5% increase. And if you look at inflation and stuff like that, it makes sense. That's where it should be. So I don't think prices are overpriced in our market. Now, I can't speak for every market. You look at, you look at San Francisco, prices are crazy over there, right? But I, from what I hear, because I belong to masterminds, we have our own mastermind of real estate, of, land, of advanced land flippers and real estate investors. What I hear is that even California is starting to slow down already. Other markets are starting to slow down already. Even the multifamily, I just heard today that the Dallas market is actually starting to see stagnating and even reduce, reduce trends because a lot of new products coming on the market. So overall, it's just starts settling down. And I think it's going to, go into a soft landing where just everyone's just like some people are going to always get in trouble, but not that many. And that's actually a good thing. The worst thing really is uh, when there's panic breaking out. Now, it's also a great opportunity to buy. But when panic breaks out, there's always a time period where, where nobody buys anything and you have to kind of adjust during that time period. But a just settling of the market would be a good thing. Yes, yes. I think that's that's what sets apart the good investors from the not so good investors is the ability to identify that the market, identify the opportunity and not panicking right. when, you know, the, the stuff hits the fan, so to speak. Right. right. I mean, we bought, uh, we, we are kind of eternal contrarian, like in the, the first time we ever bought houses was in 2009. When the market was completely in the gutters, we we're like, OK, now is the time to buy houses. Right. Because we were able to get them for twenty five and thirty five thousand dollars, and we still own them, and these houses are now worth one hundred fifty to two hundred. Yeah, and a lot of people lost, but you can't play the market in an up and a down. You just got to know what to do in the right market, right? So, uh, and all throughout, we of course we still continue flipping our land. Yeah, that's right. Excellent. Let's get on and do the mogul round, all right? And that's when uh, I, am, I really want to get to know your mindset, know what made you successful, and you know, understand a little more about you. So are you ready? Yes, I am. 
Excellent. All right, great. So if you can give your 20-year-old self a word of advice, what would it be? The word of advice would probably be, don't think you're too young. Because that happened to me. I always thought I'm too young. And it might have been from bringing up that uh, at, the kitchen, at the table when you're little, you get to sit on this little table, not on the big table. And it's like, oh, no, you're too young to decide that. You're too young. So I always thought, oh, in order to play a role in business, I got to be older. Well, I'm 48 now. And now I'm all of a sudden, I'm the old guy in the room, like in some, in some cases. And I was like, what happened? I went from the feeling too young to now almost like being too old or so. So now... It doesn't matter. Look at the young people out there who have, have accomplished tremendous stuff. Look at Mark Zuckerberg, like how he basically stood up to Wall Street and maintained his ownership of Facebook even through going public, like of, of the voting shares. I mean, look at these things. Be bold. Nobody cares about your age. People only care about your capabilities. So build those capabilities and don't ever think you're too young. Excellent. Now, what are your three most influential books and why? Well, one of them obviously is Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, probably everyone mentions, but it, it was a mind shifter for me from having come from a family by my dad is a government employee and my mom's a stay-at-home mom. All my relatives are work for companies, worked until they're 65, then retired. And to the switch of an entrepreneur, real estate, what? And uh, that was a big mind shifter. Uh, another one, if I may be just so, uh, so vain and just mention my own book, of course, for our cash. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, another one that I want to mention is called Essentialism. I forgot the author name. I have it here in the bookshelf behind me. But it's a spectacular book about focusing on the one thing that matters most. And because at the end of the day, you can't do 25 different things. We have a saying that says, get in line, stay in line. And basically, there's nothing wrong with, with looking at a bunch of different investment opportunities at the beginning or techniques to invest at the beginning. But once you know yourself, know what you like, know what you don't like, then pick one and then stick to it and put the blinders on and then just make that one work. It's like the core of essentialism is to cut everything out that distracts you in your life from your goal. And it's an absolute spectacular book. And uh, again, the third book might be... I, Put up my own right now, but if I just turn around and look at this, anything that has been written about Warren Buffett, for that matter, because uh, I'm a big Warren Buffett fan, because in essence, he exemplifies the essentialism, because he just does one thing, that is read, uh, study companies and buy companies. That's all he does, and it does phenomenal. So there's some really good books about him. Excellent. Well, now, uh, what do the next five years look like for your business? Uh, good question. Right now, we are teaching a lot of people this new technique. Uh, no, not new technique, but this land flipping technique, which is actually uh, not a lot, but we I'm spending a lot of time on it because it's really our life's mission right now. We built financial wealth for ourselves, and we built that to the level that we are very much happy and comfortable and, and for the rest of our lives, pretty much. But uh, at the same time, we now have shifted outwards and uh, we are on a mission to create 1,000 millionaires. Excellent. So that's why we teach this program. That's why we're out there. That's why we have our Facebook group that's called Forever Cash. Uh, that's why we, we, our students hang out together and then help each other. And that's why we do these seminars. We don't have to do them. We don't have to do them financially. We don't have to sell these courses. But we, we do it because we have something that that the world needs to see, that the world needs to do, and that has the potential of getting thousands of people to complete financial freedom. And our goal is to just to touch the life of at least a thousand people at the million dollar level. And so our next five years are dedicated to that. I don't think it will take us five years to reach that. But after that, I don't know, we might just put up your feet, our feet and just do nothing and go travel around the world for a few years. Not sure. Nothing wrong with doing that, right? <laughs> okay, well, if, uh, if you want to get, um, get a hold of Jack and want to follow up with him, uh, you can reach him through his contact page at uh, jackbosch.com. Of course, there's also uh, the Facebook group he mentioned. I'll include the link for that in the, the comments uh, below. Also, so much uh, value in this discussion, Jack. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. Really, really appreciate it. And I look forward to uh, seeing you at the upcoming uh, convention. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the Bulletproof Cashflow Podcast. 
For more free podcasts, articles, videos, and resources, go to www.bulletproofcashflow.com. 